Okay. So, to kick off our evening, I am very delighted to introduce Jordan Urbach. He not only wears the hats of Juilliard trained violinist, in addition to being a social entrepreneur who also mentors and coaches and advises other social entrepreneurs around the world, he also is currently in his day job the national director of the Jefferson Awards for Public Service. So he's kindly offered to give us a little bit of a musical interlude um, to take you from your, your food and dinner conversation into our next several um, evening programs. Thank you so much, Jordan. We're so honored to have you join us. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm going to play one more short piece. I want to put out a quick thank you to uh, Maria, Marina, to Aaron, and uh, also to Bita for their tremendous work putting this together. And uh, thank you again for having me out here. Much appreciated. Uh, that was a uh, part of a, a piece called the Element Suite that was uh, commissioned by the United Nations, where I'm really proud to be a goodwill ambassador. And I'm going to do uh, one more. Uh, this is by popular request. Uh, this is Aria. Thank you. 
Should I keep it at eight minutes? <laughs> no. <Thank you>. Wow. <laughs> what a phenomenal way to start off the final rest of the evening. Thank you so much, Jordan. And uh, you know what it makes me think about? It, Seeing so much talent, particularly in the musical realm, makes me think about what mastery looks like. And so when we apply it to ourselves and what we're doing in whatever en endeavor, whether it's campus change and institutional leadership or innovation from the margins or building bridges across different kinds of collaboration, um, I think we can all think to ourselves, what does mastery look like to the point where we could get a standing ovation for doing what we're doing? So that's a, something I'm going to keep shooting for. Um, but what I would like to do, that's actually a good segue, because the next person I am very lucky to introduce is actually an Ashoka Fellow from Mexico, Jorge Camil Star, founder of an organization called Enova, but he's actually a serial entrepreneur, so he's had many previous ventures for such a young age. Um, and he is also one of the fastest growing social ventures in Mexico 
and there's many different reasons why for that, but a lot of it is, and he'll tell you in some of his own stories, that he had a moment of opportunity and some key, um, key partnerships that allowed him to scale, but it was also that he stepped into the opportunity to scale and was able to grow to that challenge of leadership. So I think as we all think about this huge opportunity and the huge challenges we have ahead of us, I couldn't think of a more fitting closing speaker than Jorge to, th to help us think through what we can do in our own applications um, in terms of what he's learned about his own work in terms of growing into leadership and growing into thinking about what scale means for his own work, and we can apply some of those lessons to our own. So Jorge, pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Ashoka. Thank you, USD. Thank you all for being here. So are social entrepreneurs born or made? At a young age, our dreams seem, seem to dictate everything that is possible. We are such revolutionaries into what we want to do and how we want to accomplish it. We want to change everything that is among us. Um, the ideal seems to be the only option that we have. So what happens as we get older? What does that, what happened to the fire that drives a change maker inside of us? We forget how lucky we are, and I ask all of you to make that reflection. We are among the few people in this world that, have, that will have a higher education. We are among the few people in this world that can dedicate the rest of our lives to a social purpose and a social mission. I believe we are shaped by our circumstances. Some we control and some we do not control. To relieve the suffering in life, we need to worry about the issues that we do not, that we do control. The issues that we do not control are beyond our, our control. What university we choose to go to, who we choose to marry, are decisions that will change the rest of our lives. The same way to be a social entrepreneur it's a lifelong commitment that will change the rest of our lives. When I was 11 years old, my mother took me to her job. She was a volunteer at the, public, at the largest public hospital in Mexico City. Uh, she was in charge of the leukemia department of kids ranging between three months and six years of age. Uh, the first image I had of when I arrived to this place was of a family taking her son home to die because he was diagnosed as terminal which meant no more medicine was dedicated to this person. Why? Because we need to save the medicine for someone that might have chances of surviving. When we think of the violation of human rights, we think of a jail, we think of someone not being able to express the li their liberty of expression. Uh, the lack of basic social services is also an infringement of our basic human rights. And this is happening in the developing world every single day of every single month. Uh, as a part of my social purpose, I decided to close the income and the social and economic inequality of our country. Social innovation involves passion. Social innovation involves patience. But making a living out of social innovation uh, at some points, although hard, has to come naturally. How many of us do not have a, a single idea of what our passion is? This gap should be given special attention to. We should be encouraged by academia and society to experiment with the unknown and fail fast. In the words of Adam Smith, we need to have our self-interest be beneficial to society as a whole. Enova is the fourth company I launch, and it's a social company that is in charge of designing, building, and running educational centers in low-income urban areas. I always knew what I wanted to do, um, and it was to, to, to help the inequality of my country. It wasn't until my second venture, which was a telecom firm that went bankrupt, that I understood the power of technology to bolster both social and economic development. I was hooked. I understood the role of technology as, as, a, as a means of development. Mexico has 70 million people that are not form part of the information society. 
What does this mean? It is a less transparent and a less connected economy. 72% of our users make less than $350 a month per family. 68% have never touched a computer. In less than five years, we have managed to consolidate one of the most successful digital inclusion projects in the entire world. In the next 30 months, thanks to the help of the government and the current president, we will be building more than 700 schools in Mexico, impacting more than 6 million digital citizens. At Enova, we firmly believe that the access to the internet should not be a luxury, but a human right. While preparing for this interview, I, I asked uh, social entrepreneurs, university colleagues, what can we do to produce more change makers? Not surprisingly, we all agreed that social innovators are the antidote to social injustice and that academic programs need to be more real. How else can we learn what launching a startup feels like if we've never launched a startup? In the words of Kipling, how can we meet with triumph and disaster if we have yet to understand their whereabouts? Entrepreneurialism cannot be taught with a book. It has to be taught by doing. We have to get down and dirty. So let's begin by gently and respectfully promoting the teacher entrepreneurs. Understand that they can share the experiences of entrepreneurship. An educational system is only as good as its worst teacher. So who is teaching social entrepreneurship? How many of our teachers have actually run a successful or not successful social entrepreneurship project? How many can speak firsthand of the risks, of the financing, of the hiring behind all social projects? The classroom model, I believe, is being inverted. And if universities choose to ignore this paradigm shift, they run the risk of wasting a phenomenal opportunity in the world of learning. The use of technology in a classroom should be used to complement the program. We need to remember that what matters inside a classroom is human interaction. The end of the bad teacher is near, and the rise of the super teacher is here. Entrepreneurship is taught by doing. We have complex human interactions. Today's teachers have a wide array of tools available to complement their programs. It is up to them to curate a program that has IT complement the reality of human interactions and not the other way around. So let's follow Ashoka's four pillars and understand why they are a clear, clear pillars of social innovation. When, we, when one of our clients, the state of Mexico, decided to change administrations, we deal with government, this uh, evidently has uh, its risks, um, we didn't know if we were going to continue living. We didn't know if the company was going to continue. Why? Because when there's a new change in administration, uh, all past projects get, get thought and said if they continue or not. Uh, we were running 70 schools, more than 450 employees, and had probably credits over $10 million. Uh, we did not think the new government was going to close our project, but the four months that took for them to decide yes or no in Inova are re remembered as Black October. We waited for four months to decide whether they were going to continue or not. We were financing an operation that was not financeable, and beside top management, no other colleague in the, in the company knew what was happening. The level of leadership exerted by the team was holding everyone together. The social mission was so clear and present, and the professional maturity of the team so high, that there was a tragic sense of everyone wanting to stay on a sinking ship. Uh, crisis turned into opportunity, and this is remembered as the most golden era within Enova. The rate of change, globalization, labor market transitions, and technology require that we as leaders manage and lead change efficiently. Change involves uncertainty and risk. Both common den denominators among projects taken on by social entrepreneurs. We can't forecast for uncertainty, 
and risk. We need to be built to understand that shocks make us more resilient, stronger, and are always to be expected. The university setting is a perfect ecosystem to launch startups, to try ideas within innovation hubs, and promote student-led groups. Universities need to push us and students to have real-world shocks. Um, the first time we pitched Innova to the government, we told them that we were going to build 10 centers in eight months. They came back telling us that we had three months to build 10 centers. Although none of us slept, I remember this as another golden area within the organization. And this would have never been possible without the team that made the organization what it is today. Everything was possible. We, fi we thought we were going to revolutionize the country and there was an air of inspiration within the organization. The team viewed, the, team, the term teamwork has to be seen as both an inter from an internal angle and an external angle. Internally, partners can prove to be, partners and colleagues can prove to be the greatest source of inspiration or they can be such a drag. Externally, uh, we need to learn that the term teamwork has to gravitate beyond the organization. Teamwork has to involve the government, the private sector, the community, and the rest of the world. Today's complex issues require an active participation of what we call a tri-sector collaboration. Teamwork beyond the community involves the government. Universities need to provide and train for spotting, attracting, and managing talent. How do we fire fast and hire slow? Universities need to push us and students to build intersectorial models that promote our social cause. So thank God we are emotional beings. Empathy is the ability to understand the feelings of others. But before we understand the other feelings, we have to, in the words of the Greeks, know ourselves. We have to spend time and energy to understand what really moves us. What can we do to create the life that we want? Only this way, if we will not lose the capacity to reinvent ourselves. Beyond the feelings of the self, there are the feelings of the colleagues, the driving force behind any successful firm. And beyond the feelings of the colleagues, there are the feelings of the clients and our users. Where before it was expensive to truly engage with our users, today's social media has allowed institutions to understand their needs. The ability to involve your client in the design of the products and services you will offer them is what I consider one of the greatest innovations of our times. For this reason, it is imperative that social media be given a critical role within the institution. Universities have to guide us through the complicated process of building a culture within a startup or a firm. We need the tools that will allow us to better and deeper know our colleagues, our users, and ourselves. And I regret to inform you that putting a ping pong table is not enough. <laughs> when we launched the Nova, we went to the academics and everything was theory. We went to the private sector and everything was money and returns. We went to the non, to the NGOs and everything was a lack of money. So then we went to the government and everything was politics. I come with a different model. The greatest innovation of Innova's model is that we were able to provide a social service that traditionally was provided by the government. It is crucial that we all change our view of government. The expansion of social services in developing countries offers the greatest opportunities for social entrepreneurs. Models that sell to the bottom of the pyramid cannot forget the income and disposable income limitations of this target market. It is only the government, the one that can grant the scale and be the catalyzer for social change. To be a change maker, we need to trust our ability to change. We need to understand that this is our reason for being and breathing. Understand that life is perfect, and if we connect strong enough with our cause, we will triumph. People respond to incentives. How do we create an incentive system that prizes social entrepreneurial action. No ecosystem is riper than the university to encourage their creation of the startup. 
and a link with the existing business organizations. Passion is a very necessary element, but unfortunately it's not enough. Entrepreneurship is a marathon, it is not a sprint. We need discipline. We need a culture of discipline that will guarantee the willpower that shouts to us to hold on throughout hard times. At Innova, running 10 centers is a joke compared to what we're about to embark upon now. Being meticulous and disciplined is the only way forward. Changemakers are blessed with the responsibility of impacting thousands of lives, and they are the only ones that can provide the shelter to the social injustices that plague our world. Obtaining results is a key component of every model. I suggest we all follow a smart criteria. Specific purposes for the businesses, have the key indicators be measurable, achievable, relevant to the business, and time-phased. Only this way can we understand if we're hitting the social impact we set out to accomplish. Everything needs to be measured, and we need to be taught how to measure everything that we are aiming for. The commonality that puts all of us in this room is a sense of urgency. The lack of basic social services is an infringement on our rights as human beings. The injustices in this world need to be seen as problems that need solving this instant. It is the age of disruptive social innovations, the age when fortune prizes the risk takers and the audacious. No institution is better equipped than the university in providing the living system that will allow for entrepreneurs to flourish. It is our obligation to make sure we inspire the change maker in all of us, to think boldly and with massive scale. For this way and this way only will we create a world that teaches about social injustices as something in our distant past. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jorge. Okay, so just moving on, I have the honor to do my next introduction, um, who probably doesn't need an introduction. She was uh, speaking at the opening session, so it also seemed very appropriate to have her at the closing session. Um, and she will share a few highlights. Uh, while many of you were busy exchanging uh, ideas and meeting each other uh, at the exchange, we had a, a mini track uh, of presidents and provosts who gathered to discuss ideas, collaborations, and new trends in higher education. So I have the honor of having Julie Sullivan, the provost of the University of San Diego, to share a few of her thoughts. But I also wanted to extend a thank you to the president of the University of San Diego, who also hosted the welcome lunch to the presidents and provosts. So thank you. We've had so much gracious hospitality from USD. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Marina. Well, at the opening session, I was given five minutes to welcome you, to tell you a little bit about University of San Diego's change-making vision and initiatives, and to introduce our first keynote speaker, who you all know now as the rock star, Morgan Schwenke. Tonight, I have five minutes to thank you. And first, I want to thank you. I want to thank all of you who are here who have devoted this weekend to energizing and expanding your own commitment to change making. I always tell people I don't have a lot of money, but I have less time. And you have given your most valuable resource to us this weekend, and that is time. So we thank you very much. I also want to thank my USD colleagues. There are so many students, faculty, staff who have put in enormous hours to making this a successful weekend for each of you. And while I can never name all of them, there is one that I have to name, and that is the director of our Changemaker Hub, Patricia Marquez, if you'll give her a hand.
Our Changemaker Hub is the glue that connects all of our Changemaker initiatives and leverages them. And uh, she has been one of the most enjoyable people I've ever had the opportunity to work with. Her enthusiasm is contagious. The second thing I get to do, as Marina said, is share with you a few highlights about the session we had this afternoon. This was the first time at one of the exchanges that we've devoted an afternoon to bringing the leaders, the presidents, the provosts, the trustees of universities who are committed to change making together, as, along with some current innovators in change making education to spend an afternoon discussing the future of higher education and what will it mean for us as Changemaker campuses. It was a fascinating afternoon and I think everyone left committed that we'll do this every year. And I just want to really give you just a glimpse of the topics, the highlights of the discussion, and encourage you to speak to the leader of your campus about these ideas. First, of course, we talked about access. We're all concerned about access. We're concerned about scalability of higher education, that it reaches every corner of our globe, but that it is delivered with quality. And we're concerned that in our efforts to be change makers and to enter into social entrepreneurship initiatives, we don't do anything that widens this gap, but only that closes this gap of access. Second, we talked about technology. You know, we read frequently about the threat of technology of overtaking what we do in higher education. Well, we talked mostly about, not about technology overtaking what we do, but how it will redefine the human value of higher education. Not that the value of the human's role in education will be diminished, but how will it be redefined? We talked about the fragmentation in education, how you can take a course here, a course there, in this format, in that format, and do universities play some role in creating a wholeness to this fragmentation? We talked about moving from problem-based learning to solution-based learning. We all know about problem-based learning, but what are we learning about solutions? How are we learning about the systematic characteristics and approaches of sustainable solutions today. We talked about intergenerational learning, how the stages of life that we used to think about, we begin as children where we play, then we learn, then we work, and then perhaps we play again. Well, all of these stages are becoming blended. And what is the role of intergenerational learning of the, we won't say older, we've heard from Mark Freeman, they're called the Encore Group, teaching the younger group and vice versa. What are the opportunities there? And finally, we talked about the threats. What are the threats to higher education? And the conclusion is the threats are not anything we know about today. They are not seen. The real threat probably will not even come from the education sector. It probably is not the next MOOC. The real threat, we, we really can't imagine, but it may have something to do with the diminished cost and the increased access to what we would call crowd learning and iteration. Trying something, putting it out there, getting the feedback from the rest of the world and trying it, improving it and trying it again. So I just want to conclude with telling you that the leaders of your Changemaker campuses and those that are designated, aspiring to be designated, and soon to be aspiring to be de designated, are in this journey with you. And they're really thinking deeply about how we chart this course to continue to create the everyone at Changemaker world that Bill Drayton has inspired in us. And the third thing I get to do is introduce, once again, uh, I get to introduce our final speakers. And as I think about these two people, Michelle Lehman and Bill Drayton, I'm reminded about something someone said to me many years ago. He said, you know, there are really two types of people in the world. There are those who take energy from other people, and there are those who give energy to other people. 
Well, the two people that I had the pleasure of introducing now both give a lot of energy to other people. And most of us in this room have been affected by them in some way. First, Michelle. Michelle has put her energy and her support into the Changemaker Campus Network. Many of us who have been on this journey to be designated as Changemaker Campuses have been supported by her at every step along the way. And finally, Bill Drayton. Bill Drayton is the heart. He is the profound wisdom. I dare say he maybe is the sage behind, and I don't mean that that means he's old. He's in the encore generation. <laughs> he is the sage behind this everyone a change maker world. At the University of San Diego, we had the pleasure of having Bill as our commencement speaker this past spring. And President Lyons and I had the opportunity to spend some time and dialogue with him then and this weekend. And you know, I, I get a lot of letters and most of them end up in that round file. But I've received two personal letters in my life from Bill Drayton and I know exactly where they are. And there are very few people that I can say that about. So I'd like to invite Michelle and Bill to come and recognize our expanded Changemaker Campus Network. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. This is incredible for me to look out over this sea of faces. And um, I wish I knew all of you. Um, and it's just one thing that gives me, uh, I'm just full of gratitude right now. This is incredible. This is beyond what we could have ever imagined um, years ago when Ashoka, you got started. Um, and what, even though I, I didn't meet all of you um, over the past few days, it gives me confidence to know that you were entrepreneur teachers to each other, um, and you were coaches, and you were cheerleaders, um, and knowing how much this community supports um, each other. And so I want to welcome you. Uh, and then there are other faces that I recognize. Um, I know of some of the ups and downs over the past year, uh, leadership changes, center launches, promotions, and it's so special to be a little part of that um, and to have those touch points which, with each and with a lot of you over the year. Um, and then over the past year or two, I've also closely accompanied a few of you um, as part of the Changemaker Campus selection process. And um, that's a very special journey. Uh, Changemaker Campus designation awards institutions that are attempting to embed social innovation as a core value and really think deeply about how can we build more supportive ecosystems for social entrepreneurship on campus. And so the selection process is very closely modeled after the Ashoka Fellow selection process. We try to find an entrepreneurial innovative leader. Um, we hope to support those entrepreneurial leaders to build a team. Um, and we, we talk about and try to bring in other changemaker campuses for building out that ecosystem that's supportive of change making. And just as every Ashoka Fellow has an innovative idea that they're uniquely passionate about and has that potential for systems change, um, in every Changemaker campus, I see that unique contribution that at the heart of it sort of drives that institution's social innovation work. And uh, so now, tonight, uh, we are going to increase our numbers to 22 Changemaker campuses. Um, and it, it, they are of diverse institutional types, geographic locations, um, even beyond outside of the US now, three institutions, and that diversity is intentional. Um, and really the goal there is that we want any institution of higher education to have a partner, to have someone to say, you know what, that institution kind of looks like us, and if they've managed to build a supportive ecosystem for social innovation, so can we. And so that's our hope with the Changemaker Campus Consortium, that it would be really representative 
um, and empowering uh, for, for really rethinking and reinventing higher education. And so I'd like to start out with the Changemaker Campus designation ceremony. Um, and so please join me in recognizing these institutions. Accepting the award on behalf of Boston College is Stephanie Burzen, Associate Professor of Social Work and Co-Director of the Center for Social Innovation. I'm just going to read, um, after I announce the change leader in the institution, I'm also just going to read a short blurb about the institution so that you get a sense of that unique contribution. A Jesuit institution, Boston College, sees social innovation as a pathway to social justice. As the first institution to launch a social innovation program from the Graduate School of Social Work, Boston College not only provides students the opportunity to become change makers through its social innovation and leadership master's degree, but also invites traditional service agencies and community organizations to build their social innovation capacity through BC's Social Innovation Lab. Thank you. Next we have Brigham Young University and accepting the award on behalf of Brigham Young University is Lee Perry, Lee Perry, Associate Dean of the Marriott School of Business. At Brigham Young University, faith drives a readiness to act. With a large percentage of students who complete mission trips all over the world, even before college, first year students at BYU have often already lived and worked alongside those most in need. Social entrepreneurship at BYU then is used as a tool to help students practice how to do good better. The expectation at BYU is that graduates, regardless of their career path, will live lives of impact. Congratulations. Accepting the award on behalf of Brown University is Alan Harlem, Director of Social Entrepreneurship. One of the hallmark characteristics of Brown University is its open curriculum model, putting students in charge of what content and experiences build their degree. Combined with the peer mentoring and staff support that Brown's Social Innovation Initiative provides, students can align their change-making passions with their academic pursuits in a way that the two don't compete but rather feed and strengthen each other. Congratulations. <laughs> Accepting the award on behalf of Dublin City University in Ireland is President Brain McCraith Located near one of Dublin's most disadvantaged communities, Dublin City University supports the entire life cycle of changemakers. Starting with their access program, DCU reaches back to cultivate and support underprivileged students from secondary and even elementary schools all the way through attaining a DCU degree and lifelong learning through the Age-Friendly University Initiative. DCU is challenging the norm in which social entrepreneurship education is only available to students of a privileged background and of a certain age, advancing social entrepreneurship education more accessible to all. Accepting the award on behalf of Rollins, Co oops, I'm sorry, Portland State University. 
Sana Karens Andrews, Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs. Visiting PSU, you recognize a beautiful symbiosis between Portland State University and the city in which it resides. Portland, renowned for its remarkable story of sustainability and urban regeneration, fuels PSU's advancement in these fields. The challenge of any university today is adapting to the changing landscape of higher education. How can we serve more students better and at less cost? Rethink PSU is a bold and collaborative initiative to crowdsource and then provide $3 million to implement solutions proposed by faculty, staff, and students. Congratulations. Accepting the award on behalf of Rollins College is President Lewis Duncan. <laughs> Rollins, a liberal arts college, um, at Rollins, a liberal arts college in Florida, educators insist that experience is not just the best teacher, it's the only teacher. Two years ago, the Changemaker Campus Seed was planted with one faculty member participating in a social entrepreneurship retreat hosted by the Sullivan Foundation. With astonishing speed, a dozen faculty and staff members in different disciplines across campus were pulled into the conversation, creating a task force for embedding social entrepreneurship campus-wide. Building on Rollins' national leadership in community engagement, a grassroots movement for social entrepreneurship and sustainability took full root at Rollins. Congratulations. <laughs> and finally, Accepting the award for University of Northampton in the UK is Tim Curtis, Senior Lecturer of Social Entrepreneurship and Community Development. A few years ago, Northampton's Vice Chancellor made a bold move to make social enterprise core to the institution's strategic vision. And it shows you can find social entrepreneurship on every wall and in every brochure. But more importantly, the result of this strategic shift has been that every student and faculty member is offered the opportunity to contribute to or even create their own social enterprise. Already, there are many faculty and student-run social enterprises driving the institution's positive social impact. Congratulations. Thank you so much for your attention. It was just such a pleasure to, um, we've been waiting for many months for this moment, so <laughs> thank you. And I would like to now pass the mic to Bill Drayton. Brilliant. Well, I wanna start by thanking everyone here. Uh, this is not a few people talking and everyone else listening. This is an everyone a change makers meeting where everyone is here to help everyone else be a change maker, help the country, the world through a very profound time of change. So, uh, thank you. Yesterday, you heard from Eden Full. And so, I want to share with you my own Eden Full story. Um, in elementary school, I could not begin to imagine why I was being tortured by Latin and math. And my experience with soccer, where I was always the crashy, was roughly in the same general le level of enthusiasm. But I loved starting things, especially newspapers. And eventually saved up enough to buy a mimeograph machine. Now, before that, this was pounding on a typewriter with carbon copies. So this is a huge breakthrough. Unstoppable after that. So 
It grew to 32 pages and then 50 pages and circulated in various different schools and people all over the place. And it was perfectly obvious that I had to go and get ads and I had to deal with these people in all these different places, which meant I couldn't be where I was supposed to be all the time. Well, many years later, when my mother died, I found the stack of correspondence between her and the principal. <laughs> and, uh, she was somewhat concerned about why her fifth grade son was not in school and not at home. And the principal, um, very patiently through this large pile of papers, kept saying, you've got to have trust in your son and don't show anxiety. Um, I, I remember coming home one day exceptionally late and I found my mother walking up and down in the hallway of the apartment building and I couldn't figure out what this was about. But like most people of that age, I didn't pursue it further. <laughs> um, bless this principal. He gave me an incredible gift. I mean, my parents too, but he, he was very special. I was very lucky. Um, any young person, whether it's Eden or me or many, many others that we know, uh, who have the experience, the younger the better, that they have had a dream and they have built a team and they have changed their world, they have the power from that moment on. They're never going to be afraid of anything. They're going to learn whatever they need to learn. They have the power to express love and respect in action. And that, we all know, brings happiness, health, longevity. They're going to be a change maker for life. Everything else is boring by comparison, and you just get better and better at this. That's exactly what the world needs. We need everyone to have that experience, because we're no longer in a world where repetition is the game. The game is now, and it's going to increasingly be, can you contribute to change? Automation, uh, algorithms, artificial intelligence, the web, repetition, even intellectual repetition is disappearing rapidly. Change is accelerating. We absolutely, society needs everyone to be a change maker. Um, it's not an accident that over 80% of the Ashoka fellows, check the people which were table, uh, started something in their teens, usually early teens. Now, when you look at a statistic like that and you think about your own experience, isn't it sort of obvious that most of the discussion about education reform has missed the boat? Uh, it's about access to an obsolete system, which doesn't help. The old system was master a body of knowledge and a set of rules, and then you could be a baker or a banker, whatever it is, continuing repeating that. Well, that's just obsolete. It doesn't work anymore. It's the skills of being a change maker that's key. And every child needs to master empathy, which is the foundation, and every teen, empathy, teamwork, a very different type of leadership and change making. And the only way you do that is by practicing and practicing. So I have just articulated a very different paradigm for growing up and for education. And I would add for running any institution. Uh, the key factor for success is for organization is what proportion of your people are change makers, at what level of change making skill and how good a job are you doing at helping them work together in very fluid, very open ways? That's a very different game. Now, uh, I want to pause and focus in on what this means for everyone here. Uh, the alliance, the marriage between social entrepreneurs and universities is very, very important. This is about knowledge changing the world, we need to work together. And that's why this whole weekend is so magical and we've, I, I, I think we all intuitively know the power of this. 
So let me just pause for a little bit on what this means for universities. Uh, well, first of all, like every human institution, universities are going to have to become fluid, open, teams of teams, with synapses going in every direction. So walls have to go. Um, and we all know there's a lot of work. Universities are not alone. But the universities here who are getting ahead of the curve, it's a huge opportunity. Second, we need, just as we do in elementary school and middle and high school, we need this to be an environment where everyone is encouraged to be a change maker, to have a dream and do it and build it. And students and faculty and staff and alumni, the whole constituency, and reaching back into the high schools. Uh, when you see a new paradigm, I've just given you one example, children and young people. Uh, think about this as a huge opportunity for everyone in the university. Obviously, in this case, education schools, but also psychology and history and poverty and cities. This is highly relevant. How can you run a business school if you aren't focused on fluid open teams of teams and what that means? Um, so this is a huge opportunity for the leaders in the university world to step out and just move ahead of those that got stuck by making a really big contribution. And for those of you who are presidents and have to juggle seven or eight different constituencies, this is a way you can help every constituency. So whether it's alumni or staff or community, um, everyone cares about some child, some young person, your grandchildren, your daughter. And if you help, those people do a better job of helping their daughter be a successful person in life. You have done something really important for them. This is really easy. If your six-year-old hits her four-year-old brother, you've got punishment, okay, rules and enforcement. But you can, also put your, you can also put your arm around her and say, well, how do you think your little brother felt when you did that? Now, this is not hard, but it's not the norm. And uh, we can all make a, a difference. Research, we need better measurements of empathy. I mean, there's tremendous research opportunities, teaching, writing, consulting. There is just a huge body of opportunity here. So finally, last point, uh, moving to an everyone a change maker world is the most fundamental change people have been through. All through our history, it's been about repetition because change has been so slow that in the frame of an individual life, you didn't even see it. It's going up very fast exponentially and that game is over. And helping people see that they are now in a world of change, the opposite of repetition, and what that means in terms of growing up and parenting and leading any institution, you have the ability to give people a great gift and to help society get through this change quickly. And if there's anything that social entrepreneurs and universities should be doing right now, it's this most powerful, actually pretty simple thing. We're no longer in this world, we're in a world of everyone a change maker, where everyone needs to be a change maker, and the people in this room have the courage to see it. You've stepped out ahead, now let's help everyone else get there. So thank you very, very much for being pioneers. And now I have the, the sad task of closing out. We're just a few minutes away. So I don't know about you, but this has been a few days that has really felt like a week. Uh, a week of content and ideas and people and so many things I can't wait to follow up on after I take a nap and sleep a long time. <laughs> but, um, but I just wanted to reconnect with some of the themes that we discussed. It was yesterday, but it feels like a few days ago. 
Um, and that is that all of you are really what represents the potential. And the match is what represents all the potential sparks. And the potential sparks are the potential collaborations, the potential partners, the potential employers, the potential employees that you, that you might have um, met or encountered over the past few days. And again, what we hope is that all of this potential, because of the exchange, has the potential to ignite into something bigger. But all of that will only happen if this becomes not just an event where you're inspired for a few days, but it really bleeds into a movement where this becomes part of your day-to-day -day value set, this becomes part of your larger strategic actions at your institutional priority levels, where this is not something that you just talk about, but you actually live. And so what I'm challenging you to do is to help us and you know, we, we really feel the energy while we're here in the room and we're so inspired, but how can we, as Bill was saying, really help people back on your own institutions and your own communities have some of this that we have here and take it back? So I encourage you to actually act on a lot of the ideas that you've had and, and continue the conversations that you started. Um, and there'll be many, many opportunities to continue them at future exchanges, but we also hope that you continue them on a day-to-day -day basis because that's where it really counts. But as Bill continues to talk about the importance of team of teams, uh, this entire thing couldn't have happened without many, many teams of teams. And so first I'd like to start by thanking many of our partners and sponsors without whom this wouldn't have been possible. Uh, the Dell Social Innovation Challenge, Verizon, Photo Wings, the Cordis Foundation, Turnstone, Left Brain, Right Brain Productions, Marquette University, and finally, the University of San Diego. And uh, I wanted to take also a special opportunity. I've already mentioned Provost Sullivan, President Lyons. I wanted to come back to Patricia Marquez, who has been such a Latina firecracker. And I'm so sorry that we still didn't get the chance to do salsa dancing, but I promise we can do it after this. Um, that was a, one, a great idea that we haven't yet followed up on, but we will. Um, and, and really, it's been such an honor working with you, bi-weekly calls, uh, really the energy and the vision and the strategy and the, the challenge to make it you know, more innovative and more memorable. I think we, we tried to take you up on the challenge and it was very fun working with you. So we wanted to also thank Juan Carlos Rivas and Supreet and Morgan and the 78 student volunteers who were incredible. Wow, so really it was, you know, and that's, that's, that's I'm not yet done with the team of teams, but that, that really just, I mean, that was, uh, that was just one uh, kind of one of the large teams of teams. I also just wanted to take a, a pause and take a quick step back in time because what's particularly also meaningful for me, um, in addition to being reminded on a minute-to-minute -minute basis here and a day-to-day -day basis in the office, how wonderful and lucky it is to work with phenomenal team members, including Michelle Lehman, Bita Ansari, and Aaron Krampitz, what is also wonderful is seeing in the audience faces of interns who are now working in this social entrepreneurship and education space who were part of the ideation to come up with the Changemaker Campus Initiative. Um, other uh, interns who chose campuses after high school because they wanted to find social entrepreneurship opportunities. Um, and uh, other founding team and early team members who are now either continuing to work in social entrepreneurship, identifying leading social entrepreneurs, or uh, working at campuses that are embedding a lot of these values. You know, it really just is this interconnected family and team that continues to live on. You know, and it really isn't just about whether you're part of the official team of Ashoka U, although we're always happy for extra team members, but really it's this expanding team. And you know, beyond that, I think we're so proud to work with so many incredible change leaders at all the change maker campuses and all the change teams and all the people who are actually doing the work on the ground. Um, and so it's just, it's wonderful to have so many of those people who we feel interconnected with in different ways and we really feel like we're collaborating and we're partnering, we're co-creating, we're learning together, we're 
you know, falling down, getting up together. And, and really, it, it, it is part of a journey and it is part of a larger story. So, you know, I just feel very lucky to have so many of you here to see so many familiar faces. And we hope that it's part of a much longer story that will continue to go. Um, and uh, unfortunately, that's nearly all I have, except for the fact that we can't do it and make get better without your feedback. So you have under your chairs, on your tables, or the chair you're sitting on, you might be sitting on a survey, please take two and a half minutes for the duration of this song, and we will have volunteers collecting the surveys. We want to learn, we want to iterate, and we want to make it better next year. <laughs> Please don't go anywhere. I have one final announcement that will be the punchline after the survey.
Thank you so much for your attention. It was just such a pleasure to, um, we've been waiting for many months for this moment. So <laughs> thank you. And I would like to now pass the mic to Bill Drayton. Brilliant. Well, I want to start by thanking everyone here. Uh, this is not a few people talking and everyone else listening. This is an everyone a change makers meeting where everyone is here to help everyone else be a change maker, help the country, the world through a very profound time of change. So, um, thank you. Yesterday, you heard from Eden Full. And so, I want to share with you my own Eden Full story. Um, in elementary school, I could not begin to imagine why I was being tortured by Latin and math. And my experience with soccer, where I was always the crashy, was roughly in the same general le level of enthusiasm. But I loved starting things, especially newspapers. And eventually saved up enough to buy a mimeograph machine. Now, before that, this was pounding on a typewriter with carbon copies. So this is a huge breakthrough. Unstoppable after that. So it grew to 32 pages and then 50 pages and circulated in various different schools and people all over the place. And it was perfectly obvious that I had to go and get ads and I had to deal with these people in all these different places, which meant I couldn't be where I was supposed to be all the time. Well, many years later, when my mother died, I found this stack of correspondence between her and the principal. <laughs> and, uh, she was somewhat concerned about why her fifth grade son was not in school and not at home. And the principal, um, very patiently through this large pile of papers kept saying, you've got to have trust in your son and don't show anxiety. Um, I, I remember coming home one day exceptionally late and I found my mother walking up and down in the hallway of the apartment building and I couldn't figure out what this was about. But like most people of that age, I didn't pursue it further. <laughs> um, bless this principle. He gave me an incredible gift. I mean, my parents too, but he, he was very special. I was very lucky. Um, any young person, whether it's Eden or me or many, many others that we know, uh, who have the experience, the younger the better, that they have had a dream and they have built a team and they have changed their world, they have the power from that moment on they're never going to be afraid of anything. They're going to learn whatever they need to learn. They have the power to express love and respect in action. And that, we all know, brings happiness, health, longevity. They're going to be a change maker for life. Everything else is boring by comparison, and you just get better and better at this. That's exactly what the world needs. We need everyone to have that experience because we're no longer in a world where repetition is the game. The game is now and it's going to increasingly be, can you contribute to change? Automation, uh, algorithms, artificial intelligence, the web, repetition, even intellectual repetition is disappearing rapidly. Change is accelerating. We absolutely, society needs everyone to be a change maker. Um, it's not an accident that over 80% of the Ashoka Fellows, check the people which were table, uh, started something in their teens, usually early teens. Now, when you look at a statistic like that and you think about your own experience, isn't it sort of obvious that most of the discussion about education reform has missed the boat? Uh, it's about access to an obsolete system, which doesn't help. 
the old system was master a body of knowledge and a set of rules, and then you could be a baker or a banker, whatever it is, continuing repeating that. Well, that's just obsolete. It doesn't work anymore. It's the skills of being a change maker that's key. And every child needs to master empathy, which is the foundation, and every teen, empathy, teamwork, a very different type of leadership and change making. And the only way you do that is by practicing and practicing. So I have just articulated a very different paradigm for growing up and for education. And I would add for running any institution. Uh, the key factor for success is for organization is what proportion of your people are change makers, at what level of change making skill and how good a job are you doing at helping them work together in very fluid, very open ways? That's a very different game. Now, uh, I want to pause and focus in on what this means for everyone here. Uh, the alliance, the marriage between social entrepreneurs and universities is very, very important. This is about knowledge changing the world, we need to work together. And that's why this whole weekend is so magical and we've, I, I, I think we all intuitively know the power of this. So let me just pause for a little bit on what this means for universities. Uh, well, first of all, like every human institution, universities are gonna to have to become fluid, open, teams of teams, with synapses going in every direction. So walls have to go. Um, and we all know there's a lot of work. Universities are not alone. But the universities here who are getting ahead of the curve, it's a huge opportunity. Second, we need, just as we do in elementary school and middle and high school, we need this to be an environment where everyone is encouraged to be a change maker to have a dream and do it and build it. And students and faculty and staff and alumni, the whole constituency, and reaching back into the high schools. Uh, when you see a new paradigm, I've just given you one example, children and young people. Uh, think about this as a huge opportunity for everyone in the university. Obviously, in this case, education schools but also psychology and history and poverty and cities. This is highly relevant. How can you run a business school if you aren't focused on fluid open teams of teams and what that means? Um, so this is a huge opportunity for the leaders in the university world to step out and just move ahead of those that got stuck by making a really big contribution. And for those of you who are presidents and have to juggle seven or eight different constituencies, this is a way you can help every constituency. So whether it's alumni or staff or a community, um, everyone cares about some child, some young person, your grandchildren, your daughter. And if you help, those people do a better job of helping their daughter be a successful person in life. You have done something really important for them. This is really easy. If your six-year-old hits her four-year-old brother, you've got punishment, okay, rules and enforcement. But you can, also put your, you can also put your arm around her and say, well, how do you think your little brother felt when you did that? Now, this is not hard, but it's not the norm. And uh, we can all make a, a difference. Research, we need better measurements of empathy. I mean, there's tremendous research opportunities, teaching, writing, consulting. There is just a huge body of opportunity here. So finally, last point, uh, moving to an everyone a change maker world is the most fundamental change people have been through. All through our history, it's been about repetition because change has been so slow that in the frame of an individual life, you didn't even see it. 
It's going up very fast exponentially, and that game is over. And helping people see that they are now in a world of change, the opposite of repetition, and what that means in terms of growing up and parenting and leading any institution, you have the ability to give people a great gift and to help society get through this change quickly. And if there's anything that social entrepreneurs and universities should be doing right now, it's this most powerful, actually pretty simple thing. We're no longer in this world, we're in a world of everyone a change maker, where everyone needs to be a change maker, and the people in this room have the courage to see it. You've stepped out ahead, now let's help everyone else get there. So thank you very, very much for being pioneers.